This is the Culture Cast, Episode 6. Are you looking to improve culture at your organization? Do you like to stay up to date on what's working for other companies? If so, you've come to the right place. You're listening to the Culture Cast, a podcast that uncovers what's working for organizations in every corner of the business world. Here's your host, Amelia Wilcox. Hi, and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm your host, Amelia Wilcox. Fast growing companies can be really exciting places to work. But as they grow, those layers of management start to multiply, and it can be really hard to maintain that original culture that you had as a startup. Today, you get to hear from one of the coolest companies that I've ever encountered Clearlink. I mean, it feels like a party's going on whenever you walk through their doors. But you're going to find out there's a serious side to Clearlink as well. And they've experienced very rapid growth, but somehow managed to maintain a positive and energetic culture that they had as a startup. Now, I'd say their company culture just continues to get better and better every year. And I've interviewed Vice President of People and Brand, Jessica Jones. So listen for her tips on maintaining culture through rapid growth and even acquisition. And then her story about the Clearlink weddings is my favorite. So enjoy the show. Hi, Jessica, and thank you for being on the Culture Cast today. Of course, I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, first, I just kind of wanted you to paint a mental picture for us and just kind of walk us through what it looks like when we first step on campus into Clearlink's office building. Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's something that we actually put a lot of thought into, uh, wanting to make sure that we create an environment that's fun and inviting and uh, exciting to come to work. We spend so much time here, we want to ensure that it's a place that we enjoy while we're here. So everything from seeing people rolling around on scooters to tire swings in the marketing department, ping pong tables and video games in the break rooms, uh, and sort of the highlight, I think, uh, newest addition is our, our two-story slide on our sales floor that people are pretty excited about. Uh, that kind of lands us into our theater where they're able to watch uh, some pretty cool videos, do meetings, things like that. So um, just a really fun, um, very youthful feeling uh, design and, and really kind of bright colors and just really exciting place to be. That's awesome. It sounds like it's really, really energetic environment. Do you guys have a much younger demographic or what would you say that the age groups that work for you typically are? You know, I think it really ranges. Um, I mean, we certainly, I think by nature of the, of the type of work that we're doing, a lot of times we are able to bring people in early in their careers and train them. Um, and so because of that, we do tend to call, to target a lot of college students that are working through school or have just recently graduated. Um, but that being said, I think there's a, you know, there's a wide range of people. There's, um, you know, certainly a lot of more tenured reps that are on our phones and certainly throughout our corporate staff, there's a lot of people with, with a variety of experience. So Cool. So that, there is some diversity there then. That's yes. great. Yeah, absolutely. So can you give me just a little bit of a backstory about Clearlink? How did it get started? What do you guys do? And just kind of let us know, like, who is Clearlink? Yeah. So um, at our core, essentially, we're a digital marketing and sales company. Um, we actually started and were founded um, way back in the day as a company called Odyssey Web. And really, they were a web development company. So our current CTO, and a partner actually started that company, um, brought our current CEO, Phil Hansen, in to manage all of the sales activities within that organization. And it kind of evolved. Over time, they were actually able to bring on uh, a variety of different partners. They worked with some really reputable reputable nationwide companies. Um, and Dish Network became one of those partners. And the relationship with Dish actually sort of changed the way that we did things, um, turned us into more of a performance-based model. So as opposed to sort of a traditional web design company, we actually became more of a partner to Dish in the way that we were doing our marketing. Uh, and then we started to tack on the sales piece. So we acted as sort of an arm to Dish and we're actually creating websites uh, and driving traffic into our call center to augment what they were doing as far as acquiring new customers. Um, and that business model caught on and we've been actually able to add on 15 additional companies and growing um, primarily within the home services space. So, you know, home security, internet, phone, television, um, but also expanding into the insurance space and a variety of other um, verticals as well. So it's been, been a really fun ride, um, very kind of cutting edge, digital focused um, company, but primarily marketing and sales. So is, is there a lot of competition in your space? It sounds like what you guys do is kind of niche and it's kind of, like you said, cutting edge. Are you guys kind of the, the, the big leader in your industry or are there other competitors out there? 
Um, it's a great question. So we do certainly have competitors, primarily though on either one uh, one side of the piece or the other. So we have a lot of agencies um, that our partners partner with to do some of the marketing for them. Um, so in a sense, they're sort of our, our competitors in that space. And then there's certainly a lot of uh, sales center partners that do that piece of, of the business for our partners. Um, we really only have one other, uh, interestingly enough, only one other main competitor um, nationally that does exactly what we do and does kind of the full cycle marketing and sales and acquisition for their customers from start to finish. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, how did you get started with ClearLink? What brought you personally um, on your path in your life to end <laughs> up here at ClearLink? Where were you before and how, what attracted you to this to this company? Yeah, great, great question. And um, so I was actually at, at another digital marketing company downtown called Neutron Interactive. Um, and so oh, they we've done work for them. Too. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so I know them. <laughs> yeah, they're a really fun organization. Um, I had about four years um, with them and actually came in with them on their kind of ground floor it was like their seventh employee hired. Um, I got to do a lot of really fun stuff with them and actually was not looking to make a change. I, I was loving what I was doing, loving the people I worked with. Um, but coincidentally, we were in the same building um, as a recruiting firm. Um, and the main primary recruiter that worked at that firm or owned the firm, rather, I guess, was the former VP of people here. Ah. So when the, when the position opened up here, um, they went to him and said, hey, you know, can you help us find this person? He and I had a relationship just kind of in working in close quarters. And so he started hitting me up and saying, you'd love Clearlink. I'm telling you the perfect fit for it. Um, so it took a little bit of um, a little bit of pushing to get me to come in and talk to him. But once I walked in the doors, once I started talking to the people, it didn't take long for me to make the decision that it was the right move. Um, just really, really smart, really um really amazing people. And uh, I felt like I could really get behind the vision of what they were looking to do long term. Yeah. And speak a little bit about that vision. What is the vision, the mission, and, and all of that that you guys have so ingrained in your culture? Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think, I think really, you know, the business itself and sort of the individual things that happen within the business can change as market changes and things grow. Um, you know, we recently went through a, a really large acquisition um, with a global company. And so certainly the day to day um, focus can change periodically and does change. But I think what does remain consistent and constant is the vision around um, sort of why are we doing business? What, what is it that we're trying to provide? And I think that goes back to the vision that Phil Hansen initially created when he created the company, um, which was to, to make um, make a company to grow an organization that actually people enjoyed coming to work, that they felt valued, that they had an opportunity to do challenging and innovative and fun things, um, and to build relationships with the people around them. I mean, he, um, feel it, well, as most of us feel like, we spend so much time at work, it should be enjoyable. And so we really wanted to create a culture and create an environment that um, got behind that. And so you know, luckily for me, that's something I'm passionate about. And so I get the opportunity day to day to, you know, work with him and the senior leadership team to, to continue to make sure that we're, we're delivering on those things. Um, and, you know, like I said, I mean, certainly it's not ancillary, but the business that drives that is obviously a part of it. But I think the vision really boils down to what kind of a company did we want to be? Um, and what are we doing to continue to maintain that? Yeah, I really get the feeling that you guys do put your people first. And it's like what the company does is almost secondary to <laughs> the culture that you guys have built in those people. Yep. So can you tell me a little bit more about that culture, um, how you would describe the culture that you guys have built and what's unique about it? Sure. Um, so I think, it, it, you know, as I mentioned, it kind of boils down to those things where we really want to create a place that people feel valued. That's so important to all of us. And it's um, such kind of a key thing to just human nature. And so I think it's um, I think it's twofold. I think it's a two way relationship. We, we one, we do require a lot from our employees. We um, we have a pretty difficult hiring process. We try to bring in people that aren't just smart and really good at what they do, but they're also just genuinely passionate people. They're people that are going to get invested in both the people around them as well as the company as well as their work. Um, and so when you do that and you hire a team of people that has that personality, um, I mean, really, really amazing things happen and we're able to, to, to deliver, you know, really wonderful things for our clients. We're able to have exponential growth like we've experienced. And then when you create an environment that's that winning, that much of a winning culture, you get to you get to reward that. Um, you get to reward that hard work and, and that performance. And so I think um, sometimes it maybe gets misrepresentative that all we do is, you know, have a lot of fun, but really all of those things are really rewards. They're, they're celebrating our successes. They're things that we're doing to, 
to celebrate success and also to foster, you know, relationship building. Um, so getting into, I guess, some examples of some of those things. I mean, some of the staples for us that, you know, are kind of every year we do take our top sales performers to Vegas every year for kind of a really crazy fun trip that always has a, fun, a ton of stories to be told afterwards. Um, we do... Um, we do annual, uh, or excuse me, we do wellness days where we actually go up to a variety of different places within the valley. And, um, you know, in a single day, we'll do something like yoga, paddle boarding, and golf or, or something like that. And so some of our corporate staff has the opportunity to take advantage of those things. Um, we do, gosh, I'm, now I'm drawing a blank, but there's there's so many things that we're constantly, um, that we're constantly putting. I mean, it's everything from, you know, diving in a pool for money to employee appreciation days that include, you know, sumo wrestling in the parking lot. I mean, it's, it, the list goes on and on. So I think it's, it's always, and I think that's the other piece is that it's always kind of changing and innovating and we have a really good um, pulse on our people. And so what maybe was really engaging for the group of people three years ago and was really something that was rewarding to them may not be the same thing that resonates with our group now. And so I think the key for us has been to make sure that we're always tapped into what's really motivating and exciting for our current employees. And, um, you know, so that means that every single time that we go and kind of put that stuff out there, we come back with things that we would have, we would have never thought of on our own. So how do you collect that information from your employees? Do you guys survey them after events and things that you put together? Or how do you know what it is that they want? Sure. I think it, certainly we do a lot of surveys. So obviously that's part of it. I think the other thing is, is you can't um, take away the value of having real conversations. So um, we certainly are always trying to be involved with uh, with our our employees at every level and, and asking them about the things that they enjoy, the things that they want to do. Um, we have employee advocates on our sales floor that are talking to our employees all the time about what are their lives like and really just trying to understand them as a whole, a whole person and then understanding, you know, backwards from there, what are the things that are going to be exciting for them. And then one thing I think that we do that is also unique is we've created these culture committees. Um, and these committees are actually made up of um, pieces or indiv individuals from all across the company. And so from every sort of department and every, every area of the business, we have have representatives, people that um, we feel like are, are a good representation are actually going to go and also solicit information from those around them. Uh, and they make up these committees. And so we actually have four committees focused on some of our four main areas. of, um, And one is uh, growth and development, um, relationships, um, per perks and benefits, and then community. And so those cultures have a leader that's uh, on the on the leadership team, um, and they, they we meet on a regular basis, some bi biweekly, some monthly, and we talk about you know what what have we done, what worked really well in this last event, what can we do coming up. We brainstorm um, different ideas, and a lot of times these culture committees are the ones that are both coming up with ideas as well as um, really kind of headlining the execution of them, which has been really really successful for us. So it sounds like you guys have really made culture a really high priority because that, that takes time, that takes money. There's a lot of intention there. Yes. Um, did that, was that something that you guys had to sell to the CEO or did that come from the top down? No, it came from the top down. Our current structure and the way that um, we're set up is actually um, Phil Hansen, our CEO, has a few direct reports. Um, and interestingly enough, um, his two of his four direct reports are myself and our VP of HR. I oversee all of our employee development, um, culture, communications, and our VP of HR, um, all of our HR initiatives, facilities, and then certainly she has a heavy hand in, in culture as well. Um, and he spends a lot of his time and effort in that arena. He does that on purpose. He doesn't have a marketing report to him. He doesn't have other areas of the business, but because he's passionate about those things. He's passionate about the people. He's passionate about the culture. Um, and he really, that's where he, that's where he loves to be. So, um, so yeah, we're lucky, I think in that sense is that we don't really have to sell him a lot of times on the concept of why we should do things or why they're important. He knows all of that. He's the one that's driving. How can we make sure that people feel that way? Yeah. And that's something that seems like you just absolutely have to have to be successful in this yes. area of business. Um, so you guys have recently undergone, well, since forever, since you guys started, <laughs> you guys have undergone just constant growth. You guys are winning the Fast 50. seems like every year you guys are winning best places to work. So when an organization is changing and growing as quickly as you guys have been, what were the keys you would say to being able to maintain that culture and to keep the culture from just falling in on itself like it sometimes does in fast growth? Sure. Yeah. And I think growth can, can definitely be challenging. And I certainly wouldn't, um, wouldn't sit here and preach that we have not had growing pains or had moments where we thought, have we lost some of our, our culture or some of what makes us us? But I think that's exactly the key. And we kind of hit on it as well is that we're always intentionally having that conversation. We have never walked away from the table of talking about culture, talking about how our people are feeling, 
watching for indicators of whether or not they're engaged, um, looking at all of those things, it has to be really forefront for us. And so um, any times that we have felt that maybe things have slipped a little bit, I think it's because we've maybe gotten caught, so caught up in other areas of the business that we did sort of forget it momentarily. Luckily, you know, it is such a, a, a core value for us that we've quickly come back to it. Um, but I would say that is, that's really one of the biggest things. And the other thing I would say is, um, kind of what I alluded to is that it has to continue to evolve. I mean, what, what was really motivating and what was really exciting for the first, you know, 50 employees in the company when it was that size, I mean, there is just a difference in the way a, a startup functions and in the way people within a startup function. And that isn't necessarily the same as the way that it functions today with 1,500 people for us. Um, but you have to evolve with that. You can't be afraid of saying, hey, we tried this before two years ago and it didn't work, but let's try it again this way or let's try something different or let's go out and find out, you know, what matters now. So I think you constantly have to be um, not just not afraid to change but looking for change yeah and kind of it sounds like expecting that as yes. you grow kind of being aware yes. that that's what's going to happen yes um so can you give us an example of maybe a specific thing as we're talking about these growing pains and how you guys have grown and changed um a specific area that you guys experienced a growing pain and maybe some way that you overcame it as related to culture specifically sure um well, I guess I can, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm projecting a little bit too much, but I'll, I'm going to say what we're going through right now that I think could potentially be a growing pain for us. So it's something we've been scared of for some time. So we um, are actually in the process right now on Monday, we'll be starting our first new class in Phoenix, Arizona. So this will be our first time in actually opening a center outside of Utah. Um, even Orem for us was a little bit scary because <laughs> that 30, 40 minutes away, you're just not all right in the same room, kind of in the same hub. It was one of those fears, right? And so now, I mean, you take that fear and you amplify it. We can't just jump in our car and, and be there in 30 minutes. It's now we're, uh, you know, we're full, a, a plane right away. So, um, and, you know, in, in that, I mean, from in Phoenix with a different leadership team on site, I think we're, there is some fear around um, there's going to have to be a little bit of it's, it's going to create a little bit of its own culture and it may not be exactly what we have here in Salt Lake City. So I think there's some fear around that. I think we've, we've talked a lot about it and I think the initial conversations were how can we make sure that we duplicate exactly what we've done here and do it in Phoenix. Um, but I think now we've embraced the idea a little bit differently and said, you know, how can we take some of the core principles that have made us successful here in Salt Lake, but then create an environment that can sort of evolve and become its own culture um, when that really speaks to the employees there. So I don't know if that addresses the question very well, because maybe I'm just sort of projecting that there's going to be a growing pain, but we're sort of in the midst of that. And I've been talking through some of those things a lot lately. No, absolutely. I think that was fantastic. So, and you were kind of comparing the potential culture in Phoenix to what you guys have in Salt Lake. Can we yeah. compare the culture when the company kind of first started and to where it's grown today now that you guys have 1,500 bodies in, in those seats, um, what are some of the differences um, and some of the things that have stayed the same as you guys have grown? Yeah, um, so I think some of the differences certainly are, are, are things like that. Like we have to, we've had to start, now we're part of a global company. So there's, there's a whole new thing where we've had to really start recently embracing the idea of exactly this, getting on, getting on a video chat with somebody who's across the country and being able to conduct business that way. Whereas, you know, it, we really valued in the beginning being able to just walk to somebody's desk and ask them a question. And it was a struggle for us to get our heads around the idea of not being able to just all get in a room and hash something out if we need to. And so we have to take advantage of technology and different things in order to do that. Um, so that's one thing I think that is just sort of an evolution of size. Um, I would say another thing is you can't necessarily touch people the same way um, like Phil can't necessarily have the same relationship he does he did with maybe the first 20 or 30 people as he can with the, the 1500 that we have now um, so I think that then that has to start start to sort of filter down into it's really the managers and the directors and, and sort of those groups of people that are responsible for creating that same sort of relationship with their employees so they still have that same feeling that you did when you were a startup but it maybe isn't coming from the exact same person. It's still kind of, it's coming from a little bit um, different area. So you sort of have these subcultures, I think, that you start to create, um, these little sub-families where these teams, you know, have some of that same camaraderie and that same buy-in, but it's maybe to their, their group as opposed to the business as a whole, um, which obviously I think, you know, still impacts positively everybody, but it, it's not, it's a little more scalable. Yeah, definitely. And I understand that. That's really interesting that you say that too, because our company's kind of, at that place where I, I personally used to have relationships with all the people in the company. And it's just, 
we've like tripled in the last, uh, I don't know, like 17 months. <laughs> and uh-huh. so now I'm like, ah, I can't know all, all 300 people. And so, right. so what you're saying is really interesting to me too, because we're kind of going through that, trying to put those, those people in contact with the people kind of like out in the field working so that they still have that relationship. So I think that yep. that's, that's a really important thing that you pointed out and really rings true for me personally. Right. Right. Um, so as you guys have grown, um, you know, when you're a startup, there's like this high level of loyalty. People are super excited about what you're doing and where the company is going. And they've got this buy in and they're just like all ramped up all the time and just just really excited. Yep. Um, as the company grows, a lot of times that starts to change um, and you can lose some loyalty as the company is growing and p- people are less engaged with the company. So what have you guys done to maintain that level of employee loyalty and buy-in Bes- besides the, the face time with, with kind of, you know, like a team lead or somebody that's kind of a lead on the floor? What other things have you guys done to keep that loyalty? Yeah, for sure. No, I think you point out a great, I mean, it's, if you've been in a startup environment, you should certainly feel that energy. And I mean, you're willing to work 70 hour work weeks and, you know, do whatever for the company. And it is hard to maintain that and get that same level of buy-in when you start to scale and grow. And I think, it, I think like you talked about, I mean, the two-way loyalty is, is a big thing. And I think it's actually a big um, premise of sort of our culture as well. So I, I think it starts with, I think a lot of employers expect that employers are going to come in and they're going to be the first ones to give the loyalty. And then the, the, then the company will start giving that loyalty back, if that makes sense, right? Rewarding it. And I think that you really actually have to approach it probably differently because, or at least we approach it differently, I'll say. And that I think that what we need to do, what we do is we bring in, you know, really smart, talented people. And we try to, from the very beginning, give them a great work environment, a great supervisor, a leader that we know has proven themselves to actually be somebody who cares about their people, wants to develop their people, is going to provide them with growth opportunities. Not just that they're a leader, but the structure of the organization as a whole, that there's opportunities for them to grow and learn, um, that we're going to provide something that's comfortable. We're going to give them the tools that they need. We're going to, going to make it a place that they feel like they they can invest, that they can um, become loyal. Obviously, you know, we're going to give them a paycheck and we're going to give them all of the standard things, but we're going to make it a place that they feel like, no, it's, it's worthwhile for me to actually invest in this organization. And then I think you start to see that come from them as well. And then it's a two-way street. It's then you start to celebrate the successes and they start to build the relationships and we're fostering all of that, right? Like we're creating opportunities for them to start to build relationships with their team members and their manager and their, you know, the person of the, the department that they have to work closely with. And that's when you start to develop loyalty, not just to the company, but to the people around them, which translates, I think, almost to the same thing sometimes. If you're really loyal to to the people that you're working with, um, that's part of what makes a startup great. And I think that's what's, what's part of what continues to make the organization great. Oh, definitely. I I read an article the other day where they were talking about, I can't remember the percentage exactly, but it was really, really high that people will stay in an organization if they have friends in that organization. Yes. Yep. So trying to foster those friendships and I follow you guys on social media too. So I've seen like the clear link weddings that you guys have had <laughs> and yep. just all the, all the fun things you guys do. So you guys definitely practice what you preach. You've got yep. a great um, community yes, essentially. Absolutely. I'm lucky enough to be part of one of those Clearlink weddings next month. Actually, I'll be really yes, yep, <laughs> marrying a uh, marrying a guy that I met here, and uh, yeah, so we'll be oh, we'll be another. I think there's probably like 15 of us at this point. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, congratulations, <laughs> that's yeah, fantastic. Um, can you give me a couple examples? Just kind of show us some examples of how you've um, been able to see maybe in a specific employee um, their being invested in their loyalty. Um, th- I'm, I'm wording that really terribly. <laughs> like, uh, I'm looking for an example of a specific employee that you've been able to see has been able to stay loyal through um, some challenging transitions. And just, do you have any examples that come to mind of, of what you guys have been able to do and what you've seen from some employees specifically as you have grown and they've been able to stay loyal? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of examples within the organization um, of people that, I mean, I actually was lucky enough just just this afternoon to um, go do our our June um, anniversary lunch. And so we were able to give certificates and kind of talk to all the people who had their yearly anniversaries in June. And there were two employees that got to celebrate their uh, 10-year 
anniversaries. And so at 10 years, for us, we actually um, give those employees a sabbatical. So they get a one month um, sabbatical paid um, with some spending cash to go and kind of do something really cool that they've always wanted to do. Um, and so we were we were kind of talking to those em- employees and um, in a conversation with one of them, um, who's one of our, our marketing directors, Um, we were sharing kind of the ups and downs of his 10 years a little bit. And he was talking about there being times that, you know, that were really difficult for him. And I mean, he, he actually had to kind of bounce around a little bit and to a few different roles in order to find the thing that he really did well. Cause honestly coming in, he was super green, didn't have a ton of experience. And so it took a minute for them to sort of find, uh, uh, you know, where, where was the right fit? And funny enough, our CMO has a really, really similar story. Started out like in web development. It was just not the right fit for him. And he's one of the most brilliant marketers there is. So I think I think that is a demonstration of the loyalty both ways. One, you know, one for the employee to kind of keep fighting through and trying to find what works for them. Where I think a lot of times it's really easy to just go, yeah, this isn't right for me. Uh, I'm just not going to show up on Monday. I'm done. I'm going to go find something else. Um, but they felt like they, I think, were invested enough in the company and they believed enough in the vision that they wanted to keep kind of fighting through and figuring out what was good for them. And on the flip side, our loyalty to them, you know, whether we saw enough in them that we were willing to kind of go through that process with them and figure out what were they really going to be good at? Where could they survive? Where could they thrive? And we have, I mean, a handful of people that I can point to that are some of the most influential and important people within our organization that have gone through really similar struggles. Yeah, it's definitely a two-way street. I I mean, it's definitely like the employee deciding to stay, but also you guys as a company providing the opportunity for them to say, hey, I'm not thriving in this position and letting them try something different. And it sounds like you guys have also given people the opportunity to grow. Um, you said like your CMO started off green. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> kind of let, giving them the opportunity to learn on the job, providing some education and training for them. And so I think employees see that and they appreciate that and they know that this is a place that's that cares about them and wants them to grow and to thrive in their position. So I think it's definitely a two way street. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So what advice do you have for growing companies uh, that really want to maintain a good culture while they're scaling, especially if they're scaling quickly like you guys have? Um, I think, you know, some of the things that that we've talked about a little bit before, continuing to make sure that there's a focus on it, there's a conversation on it. And so, you know, it's very easy in the in the throes of growth to get really just stuck on what's happening in the business and to to not on purpose, but you just stop having those conversations, right? And so I think kind of going into it to be strategic about it and put the time on the calendar with the people that, you know, need to be and and keep making sure that you're having the conversation, make it a priority, um, making sure that you're understanding and seeing how are your people feeling? Are they still invested? Um, because not only is that a strategy for ensuring that the culture stays in place, but to be honest, it's also a performance strategy. I mean, if your people are invested and they're engaged, you're just going to get better work out of them. Um, and so I think it's, it, it is something that is easy to go, oh, that's, you know, we're not really going to focus on that, but it, it is a performance strategy. It's key to the growth, I think. Um, and the other thing I would say is transparency. So, um, uh, as I've as I've talked about a little bit, we recently went through um, an, a pretty big acquisition, and so you know, being purchased by a fifty thousand person global company for little old Clearlink in Salt Lake City, you know, was a pretty big undertaking, and it, there was a lot that went along with it. And I think it could have very easily caused a lot of um, unrest within our organization and people that thought, oh my gosh, everything that we've had is going to change and turn into this crazy corporate environment. And I think the key for us, and we've been able to really maintain. Um, just strong lines of communication. We've been very transparent. Obviously, you know, some of those things have to ha- have to happen behind closed doors, but every single piece of information that we could give our employees, we did. And so I think that helps to continue to create that loyalty too. They don't feel like they have to wonder if there's something going on. Are they going to lose their job tomorrow? What's happening? Um, and I think that with growth, because there's always going to be change that comes along with growth. And I think people are sometimes a little bit hesitant to take on change, fearful of change. But I think if you're transparent about, you know, what's, what's driving that, um, what's going to be the payoff, why are we doing it? Kind of getting people invested. I think that also goes back to one of the key things that's, that, that makes people so invested in a startup is that they're just so privy to everything that's happening that it's easy to kind of know, okay, I can, I can roll with that because I kind of understand what's behind it. When you get bigger, it's very easy to get stuck in the conversations you're having and forget to talk to everybody else about it. So I would say transparency has been really, really key for us and um, I think has helped to, to create and keep some of the loyalties that we've had. That's excellent. Excellent advice. I think you hit it right on the head with that <laughs> dissemination of information and making sure it reaches everyone in the organization. And I think that is how you get buy-in is people have to understand 
what you're doing as a whole. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, are there any examples of maybe a mistake that you at ClearLink, not you personally, but ClearLink <laughs> as a whole, maybe mm-hmm. may have made when it comes to culture? Do you have any negative examples of things you guys would do differently if you could go back? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I'm sure we've, I'm sure we have. I, I would say from my perspective, I'll say one thing that I think we had to course correct a little bit is, and you heard me probably doing it in the beginning, is, is trying to step away from, we created so much of a fun company image that we started to, um, I think some people new coming into the organization thought that was sort of a right versus understanding that those really are rewards for performance. And um, so I think we had to back out of that a little bit and start to kind of reframe some of those things um, that we were doing because what, what ended up happening is, you know, on social media, you see our brand or you see our name and it's like, oh, they go to Vegas and they do all these really cool things. And we definitely do those things. And it is a really fun place to work. But again, I go back to the fact that we get to do those things because we are very successful. Um, and so those are, those are certainly um, rewards for performance. So I don't know if that really hits it on the head. I think maybe that's more of a messaging thing around it, but, but it did start, we did start to see that become a problem for a while. We did have to course correct and we did have to set better expectations up front when we were hiring people of these are the performance standards and this is what we expect of you as an employee. Um, and the byproduct is if you come in and you do these things, you're going to get, you know, these really great things from us, but, but there is, it is a two way street. We do have performance expectations. So would you say you guys mostly made those changes just with internal communications then to your, to your own employees? Is that how you changed that? Yeah, I think so. And we're working on, um, you know, some of the, I mean, we've, we've typically have not done a ton of brand messaging. It's all been very much related to just, just, strictly recruitment efforts but I think um, we've tried to sort of deepen what people see about our brand recently and um, you know I'm lucky enough to be a part and and oversee the team that's doing that and so I think we're making a little bit more of a concerted effort to show all sides of ourselves instead of just showing you know when we post something on social media just being about the party we're going to it's also talking about hey we just planted 1200 trees for the community Um, we just did this really cool you know Um, web development thing for a nonprofit because they couldn't do it internally. Like some of the, I mean, we were always doing those things. We just weren't doing a good job of showcasing all of it. I think it was just becoming a little, it started to become a little bit just single focused of like, we have a lot of parties. (laughs) And so, um, so we just had to, we just had to, to, to reassess that a little bit, step back a little bit and just make sure that we were really painting a clear picture of all the things that we are. Yeah. And as a follower of ClearLink on social media, I can say that I have noticed a little bit of a pivot in your guys' messaging on social media too. So I see more of the um, community um, outreach stuff that you guys are doing. And so I've noticed it. So good job to your social media team. Thank you. Thank you. I will let them know. (laughs) Uh, So any last advice just for any of our listeners who are, you know, leaders in their organization like you of a few things that they can do right now and take back to their organizations to create and maintain a long-term positive corporate culture, especially if they're in a growth mode? Um, so I, I think the, the first piece of advice I would give is that um, every person, especially within a leadership position, has not just an opportunity, but I think really a responsibility to take the culture of the organization and their personal organizations very seriously. Um, I think it's easy to have looked at, you know, my, my role in general as a recruiting leader doesn't necessarily always fall into somebody that's necessarily going to be a thought leader or be really invested in the cultural pieces. Um, it's a lot, really a lot more kind of a sales focused role, but because it's a passion and because I was able to align, you know, with Phil and talk to him about his vision with that, I was able to really kind of get plugged into those conversations, um, and have a voice. And so it's, it, that's really served me well. And I think, um, I think it's important for everybody to feel like they can, they, they need to invest in that and have a voice. And I think it starts really with their own organizations. Um, you know, not to say that uh, it's not important for them to influence the organization as a whole, but I think as a leader, you can look at what is, my, I need to have a really good pulse on who my team is, how do they feel valued, what do they need from me? Um, and I think that really is, it goes back to, you know, making sure you're just, you're just spending time with your employees and getting to understand them. And if you have an organization of 100 people underneath you, Maybe that's difficult to do with every single one of them, but get your managers in, in your office, sit down with them, have conversations, make sure you understand what are their pain points, what can you do to help them, what can you do to make them feel valued. Um, I think that's where um, I personally was able to really start to see that I was able to make a difference 
um, within my own personal team. I think that they were a little bit disengaged, a little bit kind of frustrated when I came in and just starting to understand them a little bit. What were their pain points? And sometimes it's such simple things that they need. It really is not. I mean, it's not changing the entire organization. It's not changing the world. It's like they need the lights to come on at eight o'clock instead of nine o'clock because it's depressing for them or something. It's like, well, yeah, we can do that. Sure. <laughs> like, sometimes it can be very, very simple little things and the ways that they feel you know, valued is sometimes just a thank you from the right person. It's not that they necessarily always need a ton of money thrown in their face. And so I think that's key. I think, I think just understanding your people and not being afraid to have a voice uh, and get plugged in to the organization as a whole from a cultural perspective, no matter what your role is. Well, that is such great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for your time today. And just yes, of course, sharing all of your experience and your wisdom and, and the things you've seen that work and the things that you've had to change. I just really appreciate that. And we're, we've got a lot to learn from you guys. So thank well, you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. ClearLink is an excellent example and case study for what companies can do to not only improve the quality of life for their employees, but to do good in the world. And now I love what Jessica said about how they recognize their employees and how they solve the issues of employee entitlement just by reframing their messaging to their employees. I'm so glad that you care about the culture at your organization, and I want to offer you a free e-guide called the top seven tips to successfully scale your business. You can download it for free at incorporatemassage.com slash culture cast. I hope this show is of value to you and that you learned something today. If so, please subscribe to the culture cast podcast show in iTunes and leave us a positive review. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to the Culture Cast, brought to you by IncorporateMassage.com.